You are listening to Light Hearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. Today is July 14th, 2024, and this is episode 286 of Light Hearted. In a few minutes, we'll listen to a conversation about Piney Point Lighthouse in Maryland. We'll also get a report on a couple of Southern New England lighthouses, and we'll hear about an exciting lighthouse photo workshop that's coming up in Maine. But first, I want to introduce our very special uh, guest co-host for this episode, Ben Ridings, uh, who is curator for Cape May Mac. That's Cape May, M-A-C, New Jersey, which includes Cape May Lighthouse. Hi, Ben. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. It's uh, always good to be on the podcast. Well, thank you. Yes, people, uh, regular listeners, uh, and there are quite a few of them, uh, they would remember that you were just in, uh, just interviewed for the podcast. And I just want to thank you again uh, for showing me around. You and Susan uh, Krizyak there were so, so helpful for both doing the interview and for showing me around when I was there. Very much appreciated. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, and we had a good time despite the dreary and uh, occasionally uncooperative weather. Yeah, it was a little drizzly, but uh, but it was it was nice. And uh, it was Mother's Day. So and we were at the... Uh, the Physic Estate, right, one of your properties there uh, in the building that uh, over a restaurant that was open for Mother's Day. So it was a little a little hectic around there, but it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the whole whole experience. So we're speaking today on July 9th, and uh, I know the 4th of July is a special day at Cape May Lighthouse. Uh, how did that go? It went really well. We actually, both the 3rd and the 4th, we had a lighthouse and fireworks climb which is uh, folks could purchase tickets and climb to the top of the lighthouse and uh, watch fireworks go off uh, through the different municipalities around. That is so cool. And I, and I'm sure some of our listeners have seen photos like on on Facebook and other places showing the lighthouse with fireworks in the background. There aren't too many places where you can do that. No. So what what else is coming up at the lighthouse? Any, uh, I know you have some evening events, is that right? Yes. So we have events all year round. But as you can imagine, Jeremy, uh, we have a lot during the summer months. So on July 21st and August 19th, we have a full moon climb. On August 4th and September 3rd, we have a stairway to the stars lighthouse climb, which is essentially the opposite of a full moon climb. It's during the new moon. Right. Every, Every Wednesday in July and August, we have family fun days at the Cape May Lighthouse. And the last thing I'll mention is a date, which I'm sure many of your listeners have on their calendar already. August 7th is National Lighthouse Day. And uh, at the grounds of the lighthouse, we have crafts, collectibles, lawn games, and even our partners at the Wetland Institute are having a marine animal touch tank on the premises. Wow. (laughs) That sounds fantastic. And, you know, I love the idea of the nighttime events, the full moon tours and the, uh, what are the other ones called when it's not the full moon tours? Stairway to the Stars. Stairway to the Stars. Yeah. I love those because it's always, there's something special about being at a lighthouse at night. In a way, they're meant, they were meant to be seen at night with the light on and everything. And it's just, uh, it's just really something special. I I agree. I think it connects me with the, uh, the lighthouse keepers more to be at the lighthouse at night. I agree. That's true. Because uh, traditionally, you know, years ago, the lighthouse keeper and family would be the only ones there at night. So we're going to get to the interview about Piney Point in a few minutes. But first, I want to make sure everyone is aware of a photo workshop in Midcoast, Maine that's coming up in August. The workshop is led by the photographer Pete Lero. Uh, who has been on this podcast a few times. I had the chance a few days ago to speak with Pete about the workshop. So let's listen to that now. I'm speaking uh, today with my good friend, Pete Lero, uh, who is an amazing photographer. Of course, he's been on this podcast before. And Pete, uh, specifically today, I wanted to talk to you about the workshop you have coming up in Maine. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I have a photography workshop we're running in Maine, uh, August 21st to the 24th. Uh, We're basing it out of Rockland. It features a pretty much an all-day boat ride to photograph a number of lighthouses out in the Rockland and Vinyl Haven area, as well as we're going to photograph lighthouses and um, lobster harbors both day and nighttime. The boat ride, we're going to go out, we're going to photograph at least 12 lighthouses uh, all the way from Curtis Island all the way out. Uh, we're going to hit White, uh, Whitehead uh, Island, uh, Huron Neck, Saddleback Ledge, and all the lighthouses in between there. 
We're going to leave at dawn so we get sunrise and have all good lighting throughout the morning. And then we're going to do night photography at a whole bunch of lighthouses, including like Pemaquid, hopefully Marshall Point, and, and a few others. And uh, we'll do some uh, photography of the harbors and catch some of the lobster boats heading out and uh, be a nice mix of lighthouses and harbors and the whole maritime scene in in Maine. So. Sounds great to me. You know, it's an, it's an area, mid-coast Maine, Penobscot Bay. It's an area I know well, you know, going back many years. I feel like these lighthouses are old friends, but I'm lucky enough to that I'll be going on the on this. Uh, I'll be taking yeah. part in this workshop with you, yeah. which I'm really looking forward to. So I'll get to see them maybe in kind of a, a new light, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, uh, in these workshops, there, there is a not a total emphasis, but somewhat of an emphasis on night photography. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That is correct. Um, I've been photographing lighthouses at nighttime since uh, late 99, early 2000. And photo uh, lighthouses do what they do at nighttime. So why not photograph them doing what they do? During the photography workshop, I teach everybody how to use uh, different camera settings, uh, camera placement, and uh, it just helps them capture and learn how to take pictures of these things at nighttime. Uh, each lighthouse has a different signal at nighttime, so different techniques are needed for each lighthouse. And um, yeah, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. And um, you'll be joining us, as, like as you mentioned. And um, well, there's going to be 10 of us total. We have four spots left. So if anybody's interested in, you know, sign up with us, just, you know, send me a message. We'll get you on there. Uh, and we'll be doing the, the, the whole thing is going to be like a teaching seminar. Uh, even while we're out on the boat, I'll be teaching people different camera settings and, and focal lengths and such, and, uh, trying to help people take better pictures in the process. Cool. Cool. You know, I've mm -hmm. been doing photography a long time and I've tried a little bit of night photography, but so far, um, I, I'm, I'm not a real patient person in general. I just want to get something done. So I, I tend to get frustrated with night photography, but I've never had good instruction. So I'm looking, really looking forward to this. Well, we'll, uh, we'll definitely teach you a few things and you'll get some, some nice pictures out of it, I guarantee. No, even if it's bad weather, most people say that, well, they want the stars or the Milky Way or it, they're not going. And for me, it mean, it, those are nice pictures as well. But I also like going out on really foggy, misty nights because that's when you really get the the really emphasize beams of light and that's where some of my my favorite shots have actually come from just really misty nights and just learning how to cope with that how to keep your camera safe and keep the lens dry is, is something else we teach but uh i'm really hoping that actually one of the nights we shoot we actually get one of those real main thick nights and you'll get some really dramatic beams of light yeah there's a good chance we will because uh, tell me the dates we're talking about here uh august 21st through the 24th when I've, I've been going up there for at least 15 years in the main and it's always August is June through August. It, it could be very, it could be very clear. And then 15 minutes later, you know, the dew point changes and you get a really thick fog that comes in. And then half hour later, it's gone. Yeah. There have been times I've been to Pemaquid when you, you can't see the lighthouse until you're within 20 feet of it. And it's the only way to really photograph it is standing under it, looking straight up. Otherwise, if you go back 100 feet, all you're going to see is just a blinking haze of light in the sky. It's It gets really thick in some of these those long peninsulas out there in the ocean. Like I said, it, it you know, regardless, unless it's absolutely pouring rain, we'll be out there, you know, doing our photography stuff and, and getting good pictures regardless. Yeah, that's always interesting uh, seeing these places in different conditions. I've certainly seen these lighthouses in all kinds of conditions over the years, mm -hmm. but not so much at night. I did get to stay overnight near Pemaquid Point one night and got some nice sunrise sunrise pictures. Maybe I'll finally we'll, do that. We'll, we'll get you a few shots, and I guarantee once you get you catch the bug of wanting to do night photography, you'll want to go out and there do it again. It's it, it's a lot of fun. It's a whole new world of photography out there. Yeah, looking forward to the uh, the early morning cruise as well. Although I'm not really a a dawn person, but I can make mm -hmm. exceptions, and this is a good reason to uh, make an exception. Yeah, it's but with with any of that stuff, when you first get out there and you first see the lighthouse at dawn, you you wake up real quick. The adrenaline starts kicking in. Yeah. So. Oh, I I know. Well, how do people find out about this? You have a website of um, they, they can go to my website lerophotography.com. L e r r o photography.com. You scroll down a little bit, you'll see upcoming photography workshops, and the first one listed is is for Maine. You can just click on there, it has all the information, all the different lighthouses we're going to photograph. I think I think in all we're going to photograph like 15 or 16 lighthouses, um, as well as all the other scenery. So it, it's going to be a jam-packed few days. And uh, if anybody has any questions, they can just click the contact tab and I can answer whatever questions they like. 
Yeah. So. You have, do you have some other workshops coming up this year as well? We have, I have a number of reenactment photography workshops coming up, um, like Rosie, the Riveter shoots in a factory. We're doing some railroad stuff. Um, I've been talking with the East point lighthouse. Uh, we're looking at doing a reenactment, uh, lighthouse keeper reenactment and night photography workshop there in November. Uh, I just got to finalize the dates with them. This um, is New Jersey, right? East point, yeah, New East point, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And um, we're we're looking at doing uh, some other lighthouses next year, maybe doing some stuff along Cape Cod, maybe Southern California, and maybe the Apostle Islands as well, um, all involving boats. And, and, and that's one of the big things we really like to do in the workshop is go places or do things that you normally just can't do on your own, because otherwise, what's the point? So um, we're going to get some boats to take us out some places and do some night photography as well, which... Uh, I wanted to bring up that you were nice enough to invite me last month or actually a month and a half ago now out to Thomas Point for a visit and got to meet the uh, the manager of the Thomas Point Lighthouse. And uh, it, it was a really nice trip. So I appreciate you taking me out there. On that oh, trip. sure. Uh, you know, it was uh, it was a I'd say it was uh, maybe in my top 10 lighthouse visits in my 40 years of doing lighthouse stuff, oh. you know, someplace I had wanted to go for so long. And a mm -hmm. shout out to John Potvin, as he said, the lighthouse manager who made that possible, mm -hmm. took us out in his boat. And uh, to, we had a beautiful sunset. Uh, he gave us a quick tour of the lighthouse because we didn't want to miss, mm -hmm. the, miss the sunset. But it was mm -hmm. it was just fantastic. So, And, and, lucky, mm -hmm. and luckily, John was nice enough to be um, adjustable with our schedule because the night we were supposed to go was kind of raining and bad yep. weather. And next night, it really worked out. We got an incredible sunset out of it. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, that was that was great. So, Pete, uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Just say the dates again of that. It is August 21st through the 24th. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's based out of Rockland, and uh, the boat ride is going to be out of Camden, which isn't very far. And then all the lighthouses we're shooting are within an hour to an hour and a half in any direction. So we won't be too far if you get a hotel in the Rockland area. And again, uh, lerophotography.com, right? L-E-R-R-O photography.com. Thank you so much, Pete, and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. As Pete mentioned, as of this moment, there are still four spaces left for the workshop, and you can go to Lero, that's L-E-R-R-O, LeroPhotography.com to sign up. I'll be doing the workshop, and I'd love to see some of our listeners taking part as well. So let's move along. The subject of today's main interview is Piney Point Lighthouse in Maryland. Uh, you know, I think of Cape May uh, being in the same part of the world as Piney Point. Uh, you know, I'm up here in New Hampshire, so everything down there is, to me is in the same part of the world, but it's really not close at all. Uh, you are uh, Cape May are on the southern tip of New Jersey across Delaware Bay from Lewis, Delaware. And Piney Point is over at the south uh, to the southwest from Cape May at the mouth of the Potomac River in Maryland. I checked uh, Google Maps, and I believe it's about a five-hour drive between the two, so it's really not very close. The whole wow. Delmarva Peninsula is in between. So, I, again, I know it's not close to you, but have you been to Piney Point? You know, I have seen many pictures and even read some history, but I have not had the pleasure of visiting. Mm -hmm. Right. There's, problem, there's a lot of lighthouses around the Ches Chesapeake region, and uh, you've probably seen some of them. But Piney Point, again, it's a good distance from you, and it's it's not one of your majestic lighthouses. Uh, it's fairly short, but it's really got some interesting history. So speaking of that, uh, if you could, please help me introduce our interview, Ben. Sure, Jeremy. Beginning in 1821, two lightships were stationed near the mouth of the Potomac River to warn mariners of hazardous shoals. In 1836, a 35-foot-tall conical lighthouse was built at Piney Point on the north side of the river entrance in Maryland. It was the first of 11 lighthouses built on the river and one of only three that survive today. After well over a century of keepers and families living at Piney Point, the light was discontinued in 1963. The property was transferred to St. Mary's County in 1983 and the St. Clemens Island Potomac River Museum took over the operation of the site. The buildings were restored in the years that followed, and the grounds were transformed into a public park. A museum was established in a Coast Guard building near the lighthouse, but after flooding from Hurricane Isabel in 2003, the museum was relocated to a building a short distance away on higher ground. Today, the museum and the lighthouse are open all year, 
Our guest today is Ken Burke, Museum Supervisor for the Piney Point Lighthouse Museum and Historic Park. Ken and the other staff were very gracious when I visited there in mid-May, just a few days after I visited Cape May, as a matter of fact. So let's listen to my conversation with Ken Burke about Piney Point Lighthouse now. I'm here today in Piney Point, Maryland, at the Piney Point Lighthouse Museum and Historic Park, and with me is Ken Burke, a museum supervisor for the uh, museum and park here. Thanks so much for hosting me today and for doing the podcast, Ken. Oh, you're quite welcome. It's my pleasure. Well, it's, it's uh, great being here for the first time. You just gave me a nice tour of the, uh, the Lighthouse Tower and the Keeper's House and the beautiful park here, the waterfront pier and so forth. Uh, it's really a, kind of a bigger campus, I guess you'd call it, mm-hmm. than, I, than I was expecting, really. It's a beautiful place here. Again, thanks for the, the tour. So before we get into a little bit of the Lighthouse history, maybe just a little bit about you. Uh, I happened to, uh, I Googled you, and I okay. found your LinkedIn page, and I see that you have a, a very impressive background, which includes uh, 20 years at the Smithsonian, if I correct. have that right. That's correct. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, what actually led you to Piney Point? I know at this point, people like to hear me say that I lived my entire life hoping to work at a lighthouse, and, <laughs> and I cannot say that with all, with all truthfulness, uh, but... As you pointed out, I've now been in the museum business for about 30 years, and like with a lot of businesses, uh, COVID hit the museum world quite hard, especially smaller museums. And when COVID hit, I was working, I was no longer at the Smithsonian, I was working for a smaller uh, museum at that time, uh, Mm -hmm. dealing with the Civil War era nurse, Clara Barton. Um, And quickly, you know, with a small museum like that, I found myself, like a lot of folks, uh, out of the museum world for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And so basically, I've been living here in Southern Maryland for about five or six years, and I noticed this job here at the Piney Point Lighthouse Museum with the St. Mary's County Museum Division, Mm -hmm. applied for it, and somehow tricked them all into hiring me. And so I've been here a little bit over two years. I have learned a lot about lighthouses in those two years. I'm sure. Um, My background really uh, has been in history, but really has been in visitor services and in Uh, staff and volunteer management Mm -hmm. in those 30 years. But my background in school was history and political science. Uh, Yeah, well, you obviously have learned a lot about lighthouses from the tour you just gave me. So, you know, it's one of those subjects where the more you know, the the more you realize you don't know. Correct. (laughs) That's how I feel about it. Yeah. So let's talk about the lighthouse Mm -hmm. itself, the light station here. First of all, it's one of the older lighthouses in the vicinity, right? It could date to 1836. Mm-hmm. We are listed as still the oldest lighthouse still standing on the Potomac. Okay, right. The original structure. Now, there's been quite a few that have been rebuilt. Mm-hmm, uh, we, mm-hmm. we date the, our original lighthouse from 1836. Yeah. Well, there aren't a tremendous amount of number of lighthouses in the country older than 1836. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty significant. So why was a lighthouse needed here in 1836? Well, prior to that, there were originally two light ships, and as traffic on the Potomac River became heavier with the arrival of steamboats, uh, it was decided that a more permanent lighthouse was necessary to keep sail and steamer traffic off of the shoals and the the shore that protrudes here. Mm -hmm. Um, Ice also was a problem for the light ships because in the winter months, they could get frozen in. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's not so much of a problem these years. Uh, We don't really, the river really doesn't freeze up that much anymore. And, you know, it was sort of like the buoys of today that we take out of the water in the wintertime. We would take the light ship. So that meant you didn't have to do that part of it. So Mm -hmm. they decided, they, the federal government, at that time, the Department of the Treasury, uh, decided to build a permanent station here at Piney Point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know ice was a problem later on for the screw pile lights out in the bay, Mm -hmm. too. There's not so much ice on the, the bay or, or river anymore. No. So if you could clarify, clarify something for me, we actually just talked about mm-hmm. it outside, but if you look, if you Google Piney Point Lighthouse and look at various sources on the internet, some will say it's a brick tower, some will say it's a stone tower. It's pretty obvious when you get up close to it and, and look at it. It is brick. Uh, you can see better on the inside that is also brick as mm-hmm. well because you can see some of the brick has been exposed on the inside. I agree with your point earlier that you mentioned while we were out on our tour that there probably is some stone that's used in the foundation of the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if anybody sees on the internet that it's a stone lighthouse, don't believe it. It's, yeah. de- it's definitely a brick tower. 
and that brings us to the the uh, the builder, mm-hmm. right? Who uh, built a, a lot of lighthouses. I understand. Yeah. So the builder of this lighthouse was John Donahue. Mm-hmm. Uh, he built twelve of the se- first seventeen lights- lighthouses uh, in the Chesapeake Bay region. Mm-hmm. So he, in, for us, he completed the tower and the keepers' quarters in 1836 at a grand cost of three thousand eight hundred and eighty-eight dollars. And the tract of land was bought by from the Sutter family for around three hundred dollars in 1835. Any relation to the Sutters of the Gold, gold Rush fame, I, I don't wonder? think so. They actually operated, my understanding is they operated a tavern here. Okay. Different kind of yeah. Gold Rush, I suppose. But uh, something else I was trying to clarify, you helped clarify this for me when we were just over mm-hmm. there at the Keeper's House. The house that's there now, would you say it's the original house? Or I, I think the answer is maybe not straightforward. The answer is there are probably parts of it that are original. Mm-hmm. So out of the two structures at the southern end of the campus, the lighthouse and or the lighthouse tower and the keeper's quarters, the lighthouse uh, is really, very little has changed with the lighthouse over the years. Mm-hmm. Some very minor changes that we've made. Yeah. The keeper's quarters has seen a lot of changes. And so... It was built at the same time as the Lighthouse Tower in 1836. Mm-hmm. The original structure was basically on the first floor, two rooms. Um, that lasted that way to about the 1880s uh, when a second floor was added to the building. Um, and then in 1939, duties of the Lighthouse lighthouse duties transferred to the U.S. Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. And it's really under the Coast Guard that that building sees a lot of changes over the period, and the Coast Guard basically has a presence here from 1939 all the way to 1976, even though the lighthouse is decommissioned in 1964. Mm-hmm. There's still a Coast Guard presence here. The exterior definitely saw, and there's a point on the building where you can see where the Coast Guard added on an addition to the mm-hmm. back of the house. Uh, the interior walls probably changed quite a bit. So, for example, uh, there was a fireplace in there. There's no way to say that that's an original fireplace, for example, to the mid-19th century. Sure. We don't know when that was added in there. It's my understanding, to get a little bit more into the, the human history here, that there was a, always a keeper here, a principal keeper living with his family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think there were assistant keepers here. Correct me if I'm wrong about that's that. That's correct. Okay. So it was a family station with a keeper and his family. Uh, are there any particular stories or any personalities of the keepers or stories about life here that kind of stand out for you? Usually the one uh, that stands out to me is the last keeper here under the lighthouse service, but he was also the first keeper under the Coast Guard. So mm-hmm. his name was William Goshi, and he was lighthouse keeper with the lighthouse service here at Piney Point beginning in 1931. Mm-hmm. And then in 1939, when responsibilities uh, changed to the Coast Guard, he became a Coast Guardsman. Right. And he remained with the Coast Guard until his death in 1955. So he he died while on duty, but he wasn't here. He was going someplace else, but he was still in the Coast Guard. And so at the time of his death, his wife Beatrice took over for 40 days until a replacement arrived. And we talked a little bit about this when we were in the Keeper's Quarters. Besides Beatrice, there were four other women that we know who were mm-hmm. keepers here under the Lighthouse Service. Three of them assumed duties after their husbands passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, one of them received an accreditation that she did a much better, or a letter that she did a much better job than her husband did. Uh, The only one that I know of that was able to get her position on her own was a woman by the name of Helen Toon, uh, sometimes in the late 1880s. She's here for, I want to say, for about five years, but... You know, her husband had not been keeper here first, so she was able to get her job on her own. I believe it was prior to the civil service, Mm -hmm. so it would have been an appointment uh, basically from the president at that time. It's unusual. I'm sure a lot of listeners know know that there were hundreds of women keepers in this country, but as you said, the vast majority were wives, uh, sometimes daughters Mm -hmm. of keepers who always wanted somebody... Uh, else in the the household to know how to do the job in case of emergency or whatever. Right, because, you know, as as we were talking about again, uh, you know, the keepers rarely left the property unless there was an official duty that they had to attend or worship service. Yeah. So somebody did need to be here at those other times. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have a sense of how isolated this place was in its early days. Uh, In the early days, probably a little bit more isolated. Obviously, as this area becomes, I'm going to say, tourist attraction, because Mm -hmm. there is a change sort of in the early 20th century Mm -hmm. 
when obviously with boats coming down the Potomac River and down the Chesapeake, Piney Point and the surrounding area becomes a tourist destination for some of the city folk mm-hmm. uh, to escape the city. And I think at that time, the, the keepers have a little bit more responsibility of interacting with people. And I believe there's something in some of the early 20th century reports about uh, keepers receiving letters of praise about how gracious they were when visitors stopped by and opening up the tower for them or things mm-hmm. of that nature. So actually, in some ways, becoming a tour guide became part of their job as well. Yeah, that was that was true at lighthouses all over. And in some, in some places, it, was a, it became too much yeah. <laughs> for the keepers. Right. They kind of complained about it, but most of them, most of them enjoyed it, I think. Uh, well, you mentioned uh, Keeper Gorshi, was that his name? Goshi, yeah. Goshi, Goshi. I, th- I looked at the uh, board about him, and I think he said his father's name was Gorski, I believe. Well, he's originally from Poland. Right. So he became a naturalized citizen in the 1920s, mm-hmm. I believe. I had to go back and look at the record. So as we know, with a lot of folks who came in through the immigration system, names get changed a little oh, yeah. bit. I mean, it even happened in my family. Some of the names of my uh-huh. maternal grandparents got changed around by immigration. Yeah, at Ellis Island or wherever they yeah. write something down that wasn't quite right. Quite right. But uh, so uh, he was the last, as you said, last mm-hmm. civilian keeper, and then also the last Coast Guard keeper, right? Correct. Or, yeah. So yeah, he definitely was the last one to transfer from the lighthouse service to the Coast Guard. Okay. After when it becomes a Coast Guard station, there are basically after that point there were more groups of men that are here. Right. And, and then eventually there are Coast Guardsmen with their families that are here because other structures were built to house other members of the Coast Guard here as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, for example, we had a visit a couple of years ago from three sisters um, who lived all over the country. I know one was living in Virginia at the time, mm-hmm. who actually lived here with their father and mother in the late 1950s going into 1960 because they had in their possession a letter from the White House dated September of 1960 Mm -hmm. um, thanking their father for the graciousness that he showed President Eisenhower when he stopped through here. Mm -hmm. And if I believe the story correctly, the president had come down by boat to fish, but went back by helicopter instead of going back by boat. Um, And what was nice about that, it gave kind of a human touch to um, the building because the sisters were remembered which rooms were theirs, which room their parents belong, yeah. lived, slept in. There's a little alcove in one of the rooms where they actually kept their infant daughter oh, wow. at the time. And again, they were only here for about two years or so, but mm-hmm. it, it sort of gave that personal touch to it. So again, that just shows us that by that point, there were Coast Guardsmen in their families that were living here. And we know that there was another house behind our keeper's quarters, which mm-hmm. is now torn down, that another family lived in at that time. Okay. It's, it's like treasure when you find people yeah. like that and get those those memories, that firsthand stuff. Uh, so uh, the uh, county, as I understand it, got ownership of the, mm-hmm. the whole site here in 1980. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I imagine there was a lot of work, a lot of Im- improvements done at that time. So the main thing is some of the buildings were moved. Uh, mm-hmm. So there were some of those buildings that the Coast Guard had built that were damaged in storms that mm-hmm. eventually had to be torn down because of the amount of water and mold and damage that had been done to some of them. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is that there is an oil uh, refining, well, oil storage company is probably the better word, that's located nearby here. Mm-hmm. Most of our property that most of our buildings sit upon belong to that company, mm-hmm. and that was also transferred. So originally, my understanding, as I said, I've only been here a little bit over two years, is that some of the buildings at the south end of the campus, because of the flooding, were simply moved into these buildings up in this section of the campus where the oil company had been mm-hmm. located. Um, and at some point, they were converted into museum space and office space here. Mm-hmm. And then one of those buildings on the north end is also used as our maritime exhibit. I want to talk a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's When people come to visit, they a lot of people are going to come because they want to see a lighthouse. But there's a lot of other things to see as well, including the museum uh, where, in the building where we are mm-hmm. and the uh, maritime exhibit you just mentioned. Can you describe a little bit about that, what people will see when they, they come to visit here? Sure. So... Uh, the maritime exhibit is going to mainly tell the story of the people who worked the waters here, the mm-hmm. men and women who worked the waters. 
primarily with oyster harvesting yeah. is probably a better word for it. And we have a number of different boats, original boats, mm-hmm. um, that are in storage there, including some of the larger ones, such as a bug eye and a skipjack. And they were used for oyster dredging. Mm-hmm. Um, in our main museum building, we uh, go without saying, we tell this, the story of the lighthouse here. That is on our first floor. Also on that first floor, an exhibit on the U-1105 German-era submarine, which is basically sunk off the coast, about a mile off the coast here in the Potomac River. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a long story in that that we'll probably get into it a little bit later, so I won't go into great details right now. Uh, And then we also have an exhibit on the Tolson Hotel, which was a hotel that was located basically as you drive into into a down lighthouse road which is our main road here mm-hmm. for us you do a little curve around a big green space and that's where the Tolson hotel was located so it was one of those tourist destination hotels that operated mm-hmm. in the late part of the 19th century all the way i want to say to about 1940s you know a lot of damage was done to its business during the depression um, but it was at a time when americans were starting to do tourist destinations sure and you for the most part you weren't traveling from the east coast to the west coast at that time but you could travel from washington or baltimore mm-hmm. down to piney point or other places down here in southern maryland yeah and so there was an entire hotel there um so you can learn more about that and most importantly you can learn about the osprey and so those are there's are birds that return here every spring yeah it's mate for life you have an osprey nest on a we pole We do, here. and the, you'll see a lot of those poles down here. That is to help them from not sitting on electrical wires, on mm-hmm. telephone poles or electric poles. Yeah. Uh, and so they come back to the same spot. We have named ours Sid and Sal. Sid and Sal? Sid and Sal. Okay. So they come back about St. Patrick's Day, and usually by mid-September they have returned heading south, to mainly South America. Mm-hmm. They return to. So those are the exhibits here, at, besides, obviously, the lighthouse tower mm-hmm. and the keeper's quarters. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, a lot of lighthouse nuts like me are also birders. <laughs> <laughs> the wildlife is part, of, obviously a part of visiting these places mm-hmm. as well. So when people come to visit here, mm-hmm. they get to climb the tower, mm-hmm. right? They climb the lighthouse tower. They also get to go inside the keeper's house. Correct. Is it all self-guided or do you sometimes have uh, guided tours or are there docents around? So we are very fortunate to have uh, paid hourly staff here mm-hmm. who do who do the tours. Um, because our buildings are not all connected and as you notice, the campus, there's a big gap between the north end and the south end. Yeah. Um, we have to keep our buildings locked. Uh, we do charge a admission fee. The highest fee that we charge is $7, and that's basically for adults. The rates drop from mm-hmm. there for children and for senior citizens, uh, down to three fifty a person. So I think, you know, that's kind of a bargain for four different buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but because of that, you know, the, the exhibits here in our main building where we're talking right now, people can self-tour those. Mm-hmm. But we have to have a staff person go with you, with visitors, to open the other buildings. And obviously, for safety reasons, you are allowed to climb the lighthouse tower. But we need to have a staff person there in yeah. case something happens. And also to make sure that you are able to go up on your own and come down on your own. We don't allow people, to, for example, if you have an infant child, we don't want you carrying that infant child in your arms while you're trying to negotiate that staircase. Yeah. So we walk around the park here. It's a beautiful park mm-hmm. all around the, the buildings here, and uh, it's like a nice place to stroll, go out to the pier and everything. Do they have uh, events of any kind here at the park? Or? We host two, well, we host a couple of events here. Mm-hmm. So we just hosted in April sort of the kickoff in Southern Maryland of the observation of the 250th birthday of the United States. I am not going to attempt to say the name. <laughs> because it's a lot harder to say than Bicentennial was oh, yeah, in yeah. 1976. I won't try to say uh, it. Which I was around for at that time. Um, What's a sesquicentennial? It's not one it's of those. semi-sesquicentennial, okay. but I'm sure somebody listening to this will correct me. Yeah, well, I'm not going to try. 
Um, and so we, because the, and I might get this completely wrong, but my understanding is because the only major battle that occurred within the boundaries of the state of Maryland mm-hmm. was located not too far from here uh, on St. George Island, which you can view from Piney Point. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hosted a kickoff to Maryland, the Southern Maryland's observation of the 250th with reenactors from different Maryland regiments yeah. that were here. It also included period music piece um, and at least two cannons going off during the day. So I sent out a warning to all of our neighbors if they hear a cannon. It's not the British attacking. Right. Or anybody else. Or anybody else. And so we did that event. That was free to the public. Uh, Every September, we host something called Family Fest on the Potomac here. That's kind of a little mixture of everything. Um, Last year, we featured at least 15 uh, old cars. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, mostly from the late 50s to the 60s, but now old cars are getting to cars that I remember yeah, right. <laughs> from the 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also had other events going on. Uh, and every August we are free for the weekend, either of National Lighthouse Day or very close to it. I think without looking at a calendar, I want to say this year, mm-hmm. we will have a free open house on the 3rd and the 4th, whatever the Saturday and Sunday is before August 7th, which mm-hmm. is Lighthouse Day. Right. Uh, and then last year we hosted a very uh, popular uh, Halloween event mm. where one of my colleagues basically didn't really turn it into a ghost house, but turned our maritime building into an uh, education center, but with Halloween themes to it. And it was extremely popular. Uh-huh. It was a good place for people to bring their... They're small children because yeah. it was billed as not being scary. Right, right. It was not something where people were going to jump out at you. Yeah. So we are doing that this year. I think she's going to put on some more adult elements down the park. Our, our main issue with this event was it was around Halloween. So, of course, it gets dark earlier. Right. And there are not a lot of lights down here. Mm-hmm. What we've learned from that, we're going to have some floodlights down here for, yeah. this, for this October. Yeah. Good. That's great. Sounds like a lot of fun. Still on the subject of the park here, mm-hmm. uh, you were mentioning it, it gets flooded pretty often these days. Right? Yeah, my when I started here, I learned very quickly my two biggest headaches were going to be parking and water, mm-hmm. and that has borne out. Yeah, because when we do hold big events here, we have a very, as you can see, a very limited parking space. Maybe we can fit thirty cars mm-hmm. for average days. That's not an issue whatsoever. But yeah. for big events, if people are going to stay for a while. We end up having to use the local school and shuttle mm-hmm. people over. I saw the vent parking down there. Yeah, yeah. there's a sign for it. Uh, that even that's up the street here. That even mm-hmm. floods quite a bit. Okay. So we actually go to the local school, which is about uh, at most two miles away from here, uh-huh. Piney Point Elementary. Mm-hmm. Uh, water is a major issue here, um, especially around the keepers' quarters. It floods very easily. It's just with the tides, it floods. Yeah. But if there's a major storm, obviously either tropical or not tropical in nature, if it's coming from the south, it basically pushes all the water up onto our property. Uh, What we've been fortunate with is it really doesn't do damage to, for example, the keeper's quarters. There's very little water that gets into the basement. Um, We do have a pump down there, but I I never noticed a lot of water down in that basement. Um, And so there are some days that we we can still tour the the lighthouse tower rarely is off limits but sometimes the keeper's quarters has to be off limits because we cannot get in to shut the security system off Mm -hmm. when there's a lot of water down here and there is there has been shore erosion but that is a typical problem all along the coastline sure um everywhere you go basically yeah yeah uh so let's uh make a u-turn here and get back to something you mentioned earlier the german submarine Mm -hmm. uh, the u-1105 world war ii era Black Panther, I believe it's referred to as? It's referred to as Black Panther because of the coating, the black rubber coating that was on the outside of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to break this down into two. This is going to be a bit of a long story here, but there are basically two parts of it. Mm-hmm. I am not the resident expert on this. Uh, the resident expert on that is a man by the name of Aaron Hamilton. Yes, yeah, so you have his book here. I have his book, which is called German Submarine U-1105. Black Panther, the Naval Archaeology of a U-Boat. He is really the expert on it, but I'm going to break the story down into two parts with a little bit of information in each. 
So basically, in April 1944, uh, the U-1105, which was a modified Type 7-C, was launched and nicknamed the Black Panther. Uh, there were two major technical changes that made the U-1105 more adept at avoiding Allied detections. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned, I it never dawned on me, that prior to the U-1105, submarines had to stay surfaced for quite a bit to bring in air, which made them vulnerable to attack from the air. So okay. yeah. things I learned. Makes sense. So one of these... Uh, technological advances was the snorkel, which was a mast that was raised while the U-boat was submerged in near the surface. So it was designed to suck in fresh air to run the diesel motors and for the crew to breathe, while allowing the U-boat to avoid airborne or surface radar by remaining submerged. Mm -hmm. uh, it expelled noxious fumes from the motors through an inlet under the water, which cooled the heated gases and prevented uh, a smoke plume from being visible. So initially, this was meant to allow the U-boats to stay submerged for only a few days at a time, but by the end of the war, U-boats were cruising underwater for 60 to 70 days without ever fully surfacing, fully mm -hmm. surfacing. So the, and the most advanced of all technologies, the U-1105 was equipped with, with what was called Alberac, um, which is a process of coating black rubber to the U-boat. Okay. Now, there's a very in-depth explanation about holes and how they were applied. I'm not going to get into that because I'm sure at some point I will make an error. Well, I wouldn't part. know the difference. But okay. um, and only a handful of these U-boats were coated with this black rubber during the war. But mm -hmm. basically, Alberic was a two-ply coating and essentially trapped bubbles in the holes, and that significantly reduced sonar returns from the surface. Okay. So they basically went undetected mm -hmm. for a longer period of time. So the Black Panther set sail on its first combat patrol on April 12, 1945. So if anybody knows their dates, that's pretty close to the end of World War II in Europe. Uh, its destination was the Irish coast, mm -hmm. where it was to locate and attack merchant ships entering the Irish Sea around the North Channel, and it reached its operational area without incident on April 23rd, relying on its snorkel to remain submerged during its patrol. Four days later, on April 27th, it had its first combat encounter and did significant damage to the HMS Red Mill and her crew. So on May 4th, the crew of the U-1105 received radio communication that all U-boats had to surrender. Mm -hmm. And on May 10th, the U-1105 surrendered to the Royal Navy. And so this sort of gets into the second part of the story about how it ends up a mile west of Piney Point. Mm -hmm. So on June 3rd, the Royal Navy recommissioned uh, the U-1105, and she quickly became the most tested capture U-boat at the time. And the Soviet Union soon became interested in this U-boat and its technology as well. So put this all in the context of the Cold War now yeah, at this yeah. point. So as because of that, the Royal Navy convinced the U.S. Navy to take it and sail it back across the North Atlantic to join the small fleet of surrendered U-boats the U.S. now had in its own possession mm -hmm. it, because they did not want the Soviet Navy to inspect the boats. So the U.S. Navy dispatched a small crew to the U.K., commanded by Lieutenant Commander Hugh Murphy. And the U-1105 crossed the North Atlantic in the winter of 1945-1946. The two-week crossing started on December 19, 1945, and was completed on January 2, 1946, and incurred during one of the roughest storms experienced in that area. Uh, the crossing was quite eventful, as the U-1105 sailed right into a major winter storm. And Murphy was, although he had been uh, with the Navy, obviously, for quite some, it was well decorated by that point, was unfamiliar with this submarine and did not want to risk submerging it to avoid the harsh surface conditions. Huh. And as the storm worsened, the submarine started to experience 80-degree rolls that began to flood the boat through the conning tower hatch. Mm -hmm. So the solution came from a Royal Navy engineer that Murphy requested remain on board during the crossing. And he recommended sealing the hatch, raising the snorkel mast, and continue pulling in air and air from the engines and the crew while remaining surfaced. Mm -hmm. His recommendation worked, and the U-1105 sailed into Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, a week late, 
it had already by that point considered lost by the U.S. Navy, but it did arrive in time. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it is moved down here to the southern part of the Potomac River with a lot of other submarines that were already down here for testing. Uh, and from 1945 through 1949, the U-1105 spent the majority of its time in the lower Potomac River where it underwent salvage and detonation testing. Mm -hmm. Over the course of time, the U-1105 was sunk and raised six times during its stint in the U.S. Navy service, including the final detonation test on September 12, 1949. And that, after that, it sort of gets lost to time, most likely due to a paperwork error. Uh. Always the simplest things. Yeah. In June 1985, it was relocated by sports divers who were off there at the Potomac River. Um, and on May 8, 1995, the U-1105 became the state of Maryland's first underwater shipwreck preserve. Wow. And in warmer months, a buoy marked the spot of the U-1105, which I said before was a, is around 11, one mile to the west of Piney Point. One mile to the west of Piney Point. Mm-hmm. So that's a story. <laughs> that's quite a story. You know, um, there are a lot of U-boat uh, there are U-boats along the coast that were sunk in wartime mm -hmm. by the American Navy, but this is the only U-boat shipwreck I know of. You know, it's a totally different kind of story. It's uh, it's very interesting. Sunk for our well, I guess they were all sunk for our purposes, but <laughs> yeah, this was was more testing and my hometown of Portsmouth uh, figures in there too. So just to, to finish up about visiting the site here, the lighthouse, and every, is everything here open all year? Is that correct? We are open every day of the year from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. with the exception of Thanksgiving Day, Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day. We do close those three days. But you are open on New Year's Day. We are open New Year's Day. We're open <laughs> okay. Easter Sunday. We're open right. Memorial Day, 4th of July, all of those. And you mentioned before you have obviously mm -hmm. paid staff. Besides the paid staff you mentioned earlier that helped to... Uh, uh, show people around and that kind of thing. Do you have volunteers here as well? We have used volunteers. Now, because I have this paid staff, I'm not dependent on volunteers, like a lot, which is a lot of organizations are, mm -hmm. to operate. I would mainly use them during the busier months, which would be really from Memorial Day through Lighthouse Weekend, and really only on weekends. We do see a lot of our visitation, of course, on weekends. Mm -hmm. um, now, I do have one volunteer who comes every single weekend, um, like clockwork, mm -hmm. and he is our resident expert on the maritime exhibit, actually. Oh. So he kind of holds holds, holds court, court. Yep, mm -hmm. up in that end of the campus, but he is yeah. a very faithful volunteer to us. But I'm always open to, a, you know, most, most, most of my other jobs, I always worked with volunteers, so I am very appreciative of volunteer services. Mm -hmm. um, I just have not found here there's as strong of a need for it because I am fortunate to have paid staff that's here. Yeah, yeah. Well, both, both are important, of course. Uh, so I have one final question for you. This one's for bonus points. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sharpen your number two pencil. The question is, what do you enjoy uh, most, and this could be, it could be one thing, it could be many things. What do you enjoy most about your work at the Piney Point Lighthouse Museum and Historic Park? Uh, I will say that I do enjoy learning more and more about lighthouses. Okay, good. I mean, certainly all that stuff I just told you about the U1105, would not have known that two years ago at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I think really is this the beautiful natural scenery that's down here. Uh, now, I was very fortunate enough to work for 20 years in the heart of Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., and I loved that a lot. Didn't love the commute so much. Um, my commute down here from where I live is probably just as long as it would take me to get to Washington, D.C. from my home, huh. but it's all highways and beautiful scenery and rivers, and when I get down here every morning, you, even in rain, I will take a walk down to our pier. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's to see if any damage has been done to the pier by any storms, but yeah. I really enjoy that part of the, the campus here very yeah. much. Well, I can understand that. And just uh, seeing it for the first time today, I completely uh, appreciate what you're talking about here. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. Just looking out your window here and soaking mm -hmm. it all in. It's beautiful. So, uh, Ken Burke, uh, real pleasure today uh, seeing this place for the first time and, and meeting you. Uh, you uh, do have a, a wonderful place to work here, and they're lucky to have you, I think, as well. Thank you. Uh, that seems like a, an excellent fit. And uh, thank you for the tour. I very much appreciate that. Thank You're you welcome. for hosting me. And thanks for your time today. Hope to talk to you again. Thanks, Ken. All right. Thank you.
To learn more about the Piney Point Lighthouse Museum and Historic Park, go online to stmarieyscountymd.gov. That's S-T-M-A-R-Y-S County MD.gov. You can use the search button and enter Lighthouse. There's also information about the U-1105 Black Panther Historic Shipwreck Preserve, the site that Ken Burke mentioned where a German submarine lies underwater near Piney Point. Piney Point uh, is only, the lighthouse is only 35 feet tall, as I mentioned earlier, so it's not one of your majestic lighthouses like Cape May, several of those really tall ones uh, on the mid-Atlantic coast. And uh, Piney Point might not get the attention it deserves, but the park is beautiful and the museum is really worth seeing. One thing we didn't mention in the interview is the fact that there's a replica fifth order Fresnel lens on display, similar to the lens that was once used in the Piney Point Lighthouse. Now I'd like to introduce our next segment. Judy Ann Point has been doing occasional reports on happenings at lighthouses in southern New England. Judy Ann is an award-winning volunteer for Friends of Palmum Rocks Lighthouse in Rhode Island, and she's the first vice president of the American Lighthouse Foundation. In today's report, she talks about Chatham Lighthouse on Cape Cod in Massachusetts and Beaver Tail Lighthouse in Jamestown, Rhode Island. So let's listen to Judy Ann's report now. So, Judy Ann, uh, nice to talk with you again. I hear you have uh, maybe some news from the southern New England region for us today. I certainly do, Jeremy. I recently heard from Duncan Rushworth, the flotilla staff officer in charge of Chatham Lighthouse Tours for the U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. Mm -hmm. It seemed a perfect opportunity to pick up where I left off on my last report to head further south from Nosset Lighthouse along the Outer Cape and report on Chatham Lights News. Now, if you saw a map of the Cape, Chatham would be at the elbow. Just some quick historical background to set the stage. Chatham always had two lighthouse towers. The first two octagonal wooden towers were built in 1808 because they needed to distinguish the location from the single Highland or Cape Cod light to the north. In 1841, the towers were rebuilt in brick by Winslow Lewis, And in 1877, twin cast iron towers replaced the brick ones and were placed further back from the cliff. A new keeper's dwelling was also added at this time. As I mentioned in my Nosset Light report, the last of the three sister lighthouses to the north and east him needed to be replaced. So in 1923, the northern tower at Chatham was disassembled and it became the Nosset Light that you may visit today. So Duncan emailed me, that Chatham's remaining 1877 tower has recently been cleaned up and given a fresh coat of paint with a second coat being applied next year. He also gave an update on the light. When Chatham still had the two towers, they were both fitted with fourth order Fresnel lenses in 1857. In 1969, the remaining South Tower received high intensity electric searchlights with a range of 28 miles. They even had to build a larger lantern to house them the old lantern and Fresnel lens were relocated to the Atwood House Museum in Chatham. Yeah, oh, that's a site I'm very familiar with. Been there many times. I've done some research at the Atwood House, which is the Historical Society's headquarters there. Uh, and one a little bit of, I don't know if you call it trivia or not, but interesting thing about that that lantern display on the grounds with the old Fourth Order Fresnel lens from Ch- uh, Chatham uh, is that there was a movie made, uh, I'm not sure how many years ago now, maybe 15 years, something like that, a movie called The Light Keepers with Richard Dreyfus, And most of the, the movie was shot at the Race Point Lighthouse, the tip of the Cape in Provincetown. But they did at least, I think it was one or two scenes at the, the old lantern on the grounds of the Atwood House so that Dreyfus could be seen cleaning the Fresnel lens <laughs> Because the you know there was a, a modern light at Race Point, so they they made it seem like it was the same place. So just a little little inside thing about that. Uh, but anybody visiting Chatham Lighthouse needs to go down the street there to the Atwood House as well. Oh yeah, I mean, I, and I wasn't aware of that about the movie. That's cool. So in 1982, the tower was automated, and in 1994, DCB 224 Aero beacons were installed. But now. These aero beacons will soon be replaced with LED lights. And as far as tours go for Chatham, the late winter 2024 season began with private tours. And starting in July, the lighthouse will be open for public tours with gates open between 1 and 3 p.m. every Wednesday in July and August, as well as on September 4 and 11. More private tours can be arranged after that. And there's one really cool thing that I just want to mention here. 
Duncan said that this spring they hosted 180 Nauset Middle School students over two days, where they visited the lighthouse, as well as going to visit the CG 36500 motor lifeboat that's docked at the Rock Harbor Pier in Orleans, which is a town just north of Chatham. Mm -hmm. The significance of this lifeboat is huge. It is the same one involved in one of the most daring rescues in Coast Guard history. On February 18, 1952, four Coast Guard men set out and rescued 32 crewmen stranded on the oil tanker SS Pendleton that had broken apart in a storm with 60-foot seas. They carried back 32 survivors in a boat that was designed to carry half that many. And they actually made a movie of that in 2016 called The Finest Hours. Yep. Chris Pine playing Bernie Weber, uh, who was uh, basically in charge of that that crew that went out there. And he, by the way, Bernie Weber was also a a former Coast Guard lightkeeper at Highland Light on Cape Cod. Yes. Uh, so he had yes. Quite, a, quite a career. <clears throat> um, just a, a couple of things quickly. I, I'm uh, interested to hear that there will be uh, an LED light in uh, in Chatham. Uh, it's going to be quite a difference, uh, the, the sweeping DCB, you know, is so familiar there. Yes. But uh, the LEDs uh, probably it will still have the, the range that's needed. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. that's just the way of the world these days. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have an LED that's been there and with the solar power. And it, like you said, it seems to be more and more lighthouses are going to that technology. <clears throat> and uh, just one other thing is that I, I did interview a man by the name of John Gertson back in 2019, who at the time was, he was in the Coast Guard Auxiliary. He was in charge of the mm-hmm. tours at, at Chatham Light. And uh, we actually... Uh, we tried doing the interview inside the lighthouse, but it was it was pretty echoey. So yeah, <laughs> we did yeah. it in an office instead. But uh, anyway, I just want to give a shout out to John if he happens to be listening because I, I really yeah. enjoyed that that visit. And if anyone would like the website, I'll just mention that briefly: www.chathamcgaux. So it's C H A T H A M C G for Coast Guard AUX dot org. If anyone or if wants just- more information. Yeah. Or if they just Google Chatham Light Tours, I think they'll find it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So can we switch now to Rhode Island? Certainly. Okay. So back in May, I visited Beaver Tail Lighthouse with my husband, Gary. We were greeted by Beaver Tail Lighthouse Museum Association board member Ursula Parento and the BLMA president, Varjan Karentz. Ursula had contacted me to offer us a tour because of all the new and updated exhibits there. We also met Linda Warner, who was on your podcast in episode 168. Well, what hits you first when you visit Beavertail is the magnificent location at the southernmost end of Connecticut Island, also known as the town of Jamestown, Rhode Island. Beavertail is the third oldest lighthouse in the U.S. In 1749, a wooden tower was built but was destroyed by fire in 1753. A brick and stone tower immediately followed, and when that structure deteriorated, the present stone tower that you see today was built in 1856. The second thing that hit me about visiting this lighthouse were the incredible displays in the museum, and the museum is in the former keeper's house, and they also have some great displays in the oil house. Many of the displays on the wall had these beautiful wooden frames, and Ursula informed me that many were built by her husband with fantastic graphics, many of which were designed by Ursula herself. These displays indicated much of the history of Beaver Tail, as well as the history of many other Rhode Island lighthouses. There were several artifacts there, and what really, really impressed me were the many interactive and touchscreen displays, more than I've seen in any other uh, lighthouse museum. They had, you know, I love the map where you press on a lighthouse and it lights up to show you where it's located on Narragansett Bay. They had a display, a light characteristic identifier. Um, In the oil house, they had a display, a touchscreen on how a Fresnel lens works. And one of my favorites was one on Rhode Island shipwrecks with a database of over 3,400 maritime events that you could look up. It's, you know, they're really, really first rate exhibits. And I just should also mention that on one display board, they make the argument that Beaver Tail may have been the first beacon, or fire technically, that was used as a navigational aid to mariners in 1712. Hmm. It was placed there for ships in and out of Newport Harbor and Narragansett Bay. Now, Varjan, who has written quite a bit about Beaver Tail's history, likes to make the claim that Beaver Tail was first. 
Well, <laughs> I've, 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 Varjan is just such a great guy, and he's done. He's a wonderful historian for that place. He did write a book on the history of Beaver Tail yes. Light that I would recommend to people. So I, you know, I've, I've had dinner in Varjan's home, and he's been great to me. So I, I don't want to, uh, you know, dispute anything he says. Uh, I will say that there were earlier beacons in Boston Harbor before Boston Light. There was one recorded at Point Allerton in the town of Hull. But it's generally believed that that and other early beacons, be, uh, also you know, in the area of Beaver Tail and Watch Hill, I believe, in Rhode Island, I believe, was another place that had an early beacon. That they were generally warning beacons that were designed to be lit to alert people to uh, approaching enemy or something like that. It's disputed, I think, whether or not they were used for navigation at all. Maybe Verjan knows something I don't know about the one at, at Beaver Tail. So, again, I'm not going to dispute him, but uh, <laughs> now I feel like I need to do some more research on that. But I know there's, a, yeah, there's been a lot of discussion of that over the years. Yeah, He gave us an amazing tour. I just love that guy. He was wonderful. He and Ursula, you know, were, were just so sweet to bring us around and uh, it was extremely informative. And just one more thing I want to mention about Beaver Tail, and this is very important. I'd like to mention that the General Services Administration recently handed over a deed to the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, marking the transfer of Beaver Tail Lighthouse from the federal government to the state of Rhode Island. Also involved in this transfer is, of course, the town of Jamestown, but the Beaver Tail Lighthouse Museum Association will be the managers of the lighthouse, the surrounding buildings, and property. So moving forward, the board can now plan further restoration work. So this is fantastic news for Beaver Tail. When that went into the works a few years ago, I, I was thinking, obviously, the it was pretty obvious what should happen. <clears throat> I was hoping that's what would happen. Now it's it's what what is happening. So I'm really glad to hear it. Beaver Tail Lighthouse Museum Association has been a, a wonderful steward of that place. Uh, oh, and since as you 1993, said, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, uh, you know, my when my wife Charlotte and I first went there, I think it was a brand new organization and not much was there. There were people living in one of those two keepers houses. And uh, I remember the time, first time we were there, there was nobody else there. I, I definitely haven't been there again when that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> Just a cat came out that belonged to the people who lived there and uh, greeted us. That's uh, the only uh, other living soul we saw at the place was a cat. <laughs> but uh, I have many, many great memories of that place. And as you said, it is one of the best lighthouse museums around. Oh, for sure. absolutely. Absolutely. And I just have one other announcement, Jeremy, for you. Okay. Um, I heard from David Sapatka from the Friends of Plum Beach Lighthouse. Now, Plum Beach is in technically in the town of North Kingstown. It's not really not that far from Beaver Tail. He just wanted to mention that um, Plum Beach, which is the cast iron spark plug style lighthouse, turned 125 on July 1st, as it was first lit on that date in 1899. And they're planning a celebration later in the summer. Excellent. Uh, yeah, uh, Plum Beach is one of the most miraculous uh, restorations that's oh, ever yeah. been done of an American lighthouse. I mean, I remember that place when it was just a rusty hulk, and a lot of us thought it was beyond saving. But there were people who thought otherwise going back to the 80s and worked really, really hard to bring that place back, including Dave Zapaco, who's been a, yes. one of the, the leaders of that, that and effort. You Mm -hmm. You mentioned photographer. Well, his photography, his li nighttime lighthouse photography is amazing. Yes. And he does that in, uh, you know, in conjunction with the U.S. Lighthouse Society, yes. which has uh, helped with that and um, published uh, two of his books of uh, photography, his night photography. So, yeah, uh, Dave does does fantastic work. So this is all good news, I think, all around. Yeah, I uh, think so. And, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I'm glad there's no no lighthouses have fallen down in southern New England since we last spoke. It seems not since I last looked. No, right. right. But, um... I shouldn't even say that out loud. <laughs> I don't want to jinx anybody, yeah. but it's no. It's, it's <clears throat> it, this is all yeah. good news. Yeah. Right now we have the Palm and Beacon, which is near Palm and Rocks Lighthouse, where we're looking into maybe someday, you know, making sure that that doesn't fall down. So. That's another project. That's another podcast. Uh, you're talking about the <laughs> the old uh, day, day 1828 beacon. day beacon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love those things. There's only there's yeah. a handful of those dating back, you know, 150, 200 years around New England, yes. and uh, they have their own history. Yeah. yeah. You and Bob Trapani just love them. So. Yeah. 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 We did a, a podcast episode. On I that. I listened to it. Yeah. 
That was a fun one. Bob, Bob's a junkie for that kind of thing. Too, uh, I know. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, Judy Ann, it's always great talking with you, of course, and uh, be talking with you again, both uh, for your reports, and I'm sure you'll be co-hosting more episodes of the podcast. Uh, I appreciate your, your efforts and your efforts on this and also with the America Lighthouse Foundation and also with the Friends of Palmer and Rocks Lighthouse. You do, you do a great deal as a volunteer. So, so thanks for everything, Judy Ann. Thank you, Jeremy. It's always a good time here. Chatham, Massachusetts, and Jamestown, Rhode Island are two of the nicest towns in New England. I'm very happy to hear about all that good news uh, happening in both places. So, Ben, before we sign off, I wanted to ask your opinion about something. It's a question I've asked people in podcast interviews a number of times, but I did not ask you when I was there at Cape May. The question is, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing lighthouse preservation today? It's the weather. I mean, in the past few decades, we've seen upticks in major events, uh, such as, you know, hurricanes, nor'easters, winter storms, flooding, and, and even beach erosion. And, you know, it, it really transcends cultures, and it happens, you know, all over the world. And maybe this is just me, but I think the, this might be the biggest challenge because there's really nothing we can do to control the weather. I mean, and and very often these big storms give us little to no time. So, so for me personally, at the Cape May Lighthouse, I mean, if there's a big storm rolling in, all I can do is think to myself, well, I, I hope it survives this one because again, there's, there's nothing we can really do and plan for the weather uh, to, a, to a certain extent we can plan, but you, there's a major hurricane, you know, there's not really much we can do other than just, just hope. So yeah. Uh, that's not to say there aren't other big challenges facing lighthouse preservation today, but but to me, that's the one um, being, you know, at the tip of New Jersey. That's the one that always comes to mind to me. Well, I, I agree. You know, for years, I've thought that there were three, the three biggest challenges I've felt facing lighthouse preservation are in no particular order were um, lack of funding or the, you know, scarcity of funding. Um, and uh, lack of volunteers, especially I think since COVID, I think it's been hard. A lot of organizations are all volunteer or largely volunteer. And it's been hard, hard to, uh, you know, to retain a, a good number of volunteers. And uh, weather or climate change being the third challenge to preservation. But I think uh, in uh, recent years, more and more climate change is overcoming the other, other concerns. It's more of more immediate uh, concern. Uh, and I truly believe we're having, you know, the sea levels are rising and we're having more frequent, uh, severe weather. So it's, uh, that's a long way of saying I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for co-hosting today. I hope we can do it again sometime. Oh, yeah. Like I said, it's always fun being on the podcast. So anytime you want me back, I'll be happy to oblige. Excellent. Well, welcome to the lighthearted family. <laughs> I do think it's like a family, and I'm sure I'll be talking with you again. Uh, and good luck with uh, the rest of this busy season at Cape May Lighthouse. I love the events that you do, and I loved uh, seeing that very beautiful and historic lighthouse. So with that, to all our regular listeners and our new ones, thank you so much for listening, and keep a good light. Keep a good light.